Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here with part two of industrialism, nationalism, mass society, and democracy. That's Western civilization at uh, Fieldcrest High School, looking at chapters 19 and 20. Uh, it's say part two, but it might end up being parts two and three. I don't want to make these too long, but let's get started with Germany and German unification. Uh, in Germany, the unification is driven by the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. He is the chancellor, which is essentially a prime minister, a German word. Um, he does not believe in the concept of ministerial uh, responsibility, this idea that uh, a prime minister is responsible to that elected body. And he says, I'm not responsible to this Reichstag. I don't care if they are the elected body. I'm not responsible to them. Um, Machiavelli would be very proud of him, his ideas of realpolitik. This is this idea that, hey, if I have to lie or make false treaties or whatever it takes to get ahead, hey, that's what he does and that's what he gets away with. And Kaiser William I or Wilhelm I, I'm not sure why we use Kaiser, the German word for emperor or technically Caesar, uh, the German form of that and the Anglican form of William. Uh, I'm going to call him both. So if you hear me say Wilhelm I or William I, I'm talking about the same guy. Uh, um, he kind of lets Bismarck get away with whatever he wants to, and in doing so, uh, Bismarck unifies Germany by 1871. Um, William I is followed by his son, Kaiser Frederick III. Uh, William didn't really like Frederick, and there's a reason for that. Uh, he was very liberal, and uh, Bismarck, as we recall, and Wilhelm I, these are very much uh, one guy in charge, uh, nothing to do with uh, liberal policies like having like the assembly have actual power. Um, and the liberals actually hope that when Frederick becomes emperor, he's going to actually change the government and make it more democratic. However, he only reigns for 99 days. It seems that by the time his father actually dies and he comes into power, uh, he's actually suffering from an inoperable throat, throat tumor and dies after 99 days, bringing into power his son, Kaiser William II or Wilhelm II. He's the Kaiser uh, that we talk about. We talk about in World War I. That's the guy. Um, he is firmly in control of uh, Germany by the end of the 18th century. And an interesting fact about him is he was actually pulled away from his mother and father, Frederick III, by Bismarck to train him to be more in line with this more militaristic, more uh, autocratic kind of a ruler. Uh, and in the end, that sort of backfires on Bismarck because uh, Bismarck used to get in his way and Kaiser Wilhelm II wants his way. And when they disagree, he fires him and lets him go. Okay, but this is a time period in Germany of great military expansion with the unification of Germany, uh, the economy booms, uh, they become a very powerful nation both economically, militarily, and politically, uh, taking over and getting territories around the world as well. Uh, in automobiles, we've got uh, Gottlieb Daimler, uh, who along with Benz creates the company Mercedes-Benz, and of course Rudolf Diesel, who as you know invents the diesel engine, which as you also know you never have to change your spark plugs because they don't have any. There's Kaiser Wilhelm II right there. Uh, um, note his left arm there up here on his sword. Um, no, his other left, the one that's up here. That is actually because his arm is shorter than his right arm. It's a crippled arm, in fact. Uh, he, his mother is English. His dad is German. Um, and they're very liberal, but he is the opposite of them, trained by Bismarck. Uh, he puts his hand up there to kind of hide the fact that his arm is crippled. And in pictures, you don't really notice it, unless, of course, someone like me points it out to you. Okay, let's look now at Italian unification. This is, uh, again, an example of this idea of nationalism, this sort of community awareness, like in Germany, where we had this sort of idea of a common language and common religion. It doesn't mean everyone's Catholic, but everyone is generally Christian for the most part. Uh, national symbols, a sense of national pride. This is all that idea of nationalism. When we get to this idea of extreme nationalism, will cause a problem help leading to World War I. Okay, in Italy, this unification is brought about by Count Camillo de Cavour. Uh, in northern Italy, he is the prime minister who helps uh, unify the northern, more industrial part of Italy. Um, and in the south, it's Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, he unites southern Germany with his uh, army of the red shirts, sort of a militia, if you will. And uh, this is the more rural agricultural region. And it's going to cause problems later on between uh, Italy, between north and south, because one's industrialized and one's very rural. A lot like the north and the south in the United States, which left a civil war, doesn't do so here, however. They pick Victor Emmanuel II to become the first king of United Italy in 1861. And I'm sure they picked him because he had the way craziest facial hair. 
Okay, that probably wasn't it. But uh, compared to him, you know, let's face it, Garibaldi's is sort of plain Jane stuff. I think Garibaldi consoles himself by using his image to sell cigarettes. And uh, he also spent some time, of course, as a um, Robert E. Lee impersonator. What's that? I'm being told that's not true. Sorry about that. Okay, going back here to Russia. And in Russia, we've got uh, things going on with the Crimean War. And the Crimean War was the Russians trying to expand their territory into the Black Sea, what at the time is Ottoman territory, uh, former parts of what was uh, Turkey today uh, and the former Byzantine Empire, so to speak. Uh, trying to get that territory to get access to the Black Sea, thereby getting access to the, Bla uh, the Mediterranean Sea to expand their trade and their military options as well. Well, they're defeated by the British, the French, the Ottomans, because it's a balance of power thing. They don't want Russia becoming too powerful. They like them being weak. In fact, even Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary, who is supposed to be Russia's ally, turns against them, and things don't work out well at all. That lasts from 1853 to 1856. Okay, this is the time period also of the British uh, nurse Florence Nightingale, who was one of the two people who helped expand the nursing profession into a true profession and helps uh, take care of the soldiers there. Uh, in Europe, we have Tsar Alexander II, who introduces some reforms, including the emancipation of the serfs in. 1861, the same time that Italy is getting its uh, independence, but the people aren't exactly happy, including the serfs, because the landowners kept the best land for themselves. Uh, the peasants got poor land, and they had to pay for it, and they couldn't support themselves on it. And the conservatives, and basically the big landowners and, and the nobility, thought he's destroying society, so no one's happy. Um, Alexander II uh, meets an untimely death. Okay, he's assassinated in 1881, and Alexander III comes to power uh, and reverses all of those reforms. Okay. Then, of course, the book talks about the Bloody Sunday uh, Massacre. These are protesters actually trying to just deliver a, peacefully a pro, uh, petition they've had signed uh, to the Winter Palace um, in January of 1905. They're protesting against the pitiful working conditions, the poor living conditions, and the government repression. And the government repression steps up a notch because they open fire on them and kill dozens of them, uh, which will come back to haunt them later because this will then become a rallying cry for the revolution that takes place later on. During this time period, we've got two famous events, at least from British history. One is the Thin Red Line. This is the 93rd Highland Regiment, uh, who stand in the line against a charging, uh, vastly superior in terms of numbers, uh, Russian cavalry charge. Uh, they stand, line themselves up in uh, ranks only two deep, uh, drive off two attacks, and some folks say that the, the, the Russians give up and there's not the third attack uh, because they're being killed. Uh, other folks' accounts say that the Russians give up because they see only two lines of men and realize, they think to themselves, this must just be a diversionary tactic and the real battle is going on someplace else, and so they withdraw for that reason. Another uh, thing here during this Crimean War is the Charge of the Light Brigade, uh, a British unit sent to charge after a retreating uh, Russian uh, artillery unit and harass them, hopefully capture some guys and some artillery. Uh, instead, the orders get mixed up and they charge headlong against another artillery battery that's entrenched and in place and lined up with clear lines of fire. 700 guys go in, less than 200 come out. It's a massacre, not a good thing. Um, poems written about that. And then, of course, here are our Russian troops getting ready to fire uh, on the protesters here at the Winter Palace in 1905. Let's look finally here at communism for this uh, video clip here uh, and things going on in Russia. Now, at the end of this time period, in fact, during 1905, Tsar Nicholas II, Tsar being the Russian word, of course, for emperor, is in charge. He creates a Duma in response to this uh, protest that now uh, caused by the outrages of the Bloody Sunday in 1905. However, it gives that uh, Russian parliament, the Duma, no real power. And in fact, by 1907, he basically dismisses it and doesn't even bother with it even anymore. And because of that, the ideas of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels are going to expand. These are the guys who wrote the Communist Manifesto. I always include Engels because history likes to forget him. We talk about Marx, Marx, Marx. Not one of the Marx brothers, by the way. Uh, in this, I talk about the bourgeoisie. This is the middle class. And they're seen as the oppressors. Now, this is the, the upper, upper middle class here, the folks who own the factories and are, are very well off, and they are seen as repressing uh, the lower classes. That's the proletariat, the working class. They are the oppressed. Uh, they are trying to overthrow this idea of a dictatorship where a czar, in the case of uh, Russia, has absolute control and give control to the people. People own the means of production and, and run the country. Um, there are 
are, however, folks who don't believe in this complete revolution. These are Marxist revisionists. They want socialism, that is where the government, um, to simply um, move towards socialism where the government has only partial control of the means of productions through sort of democratic means. And they are seen as not following the actual ideas of Marx and Engels here, seen uh, from left to right. Uh, the emperor, again, was uh, Tsar Nicholas II. This is here, him with his family, uh, before the 1917 revolution where they are captured and all executed, including his daughter Anastasia, regardless of what the folks at Disney have to say about it. Uh, by the way, this guy over here, Kaiser Wilhelm II, that's his cousin. Uh, and in fact, the two try to get together before World War one to stop the war, and the Russian military says, too late, can't do it. I want to stop right there because it's taking longer than I thought, and then we'll kind of move on from here.